Well, hello and welcome again to our journey into algebra and number theory. And this is the last video in this section on congruences. And in the previous um, recording, we looked at the little bit of group theory. We looked at the order of an element and the order of a group. And we proved very famous theorem, Lagrange's theorem, and uh, that the order of a subgroup is a factor of the order of the group. And as a corollary to that, we saw that the order of an element, G, in a group capital G, is a factor of the order of capital G, or the number of elements in G. We can now apply that, going back into number theory, we can now apply that um, to the group ZP star uh, to obtain a famous and important theorem about integers modulo or prime. And this, of course, is Fermat's Little Theorem, sometimes called Fermat's Theorem or Fermat's Little Theorem. It wasn't expressed quite this way by Fermat, but it's certainly equivalent to it. Fermat would be quite amazed to see his theorem um, <coughs> rewritten and reanalyzed in this form and to see how it uh, could be motivated by using group theory. So here's the theorem. It says if A is an integer that's not divisible by prime P, then a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. So you're given a prime p, take any, any integer that is not divisible by that prime p, and then when you raise a to the power p minus 1, you always get 1 modulo p. The proof of this now is very, very easy because of, our, of Lagrange's theorem. So we take an element a in zp star. The size of this uh, set is p minus 1. The size of this group is p minus 1 because we're taking out 0. And the order then of any element has to divide the order of the group by our corollary to Lagrange's theorem. So that says a is a factor of p minus 1. And that simply means then if I raise a to the power p minus 1, I get 1 modulo p. The if a is in is now an integer, so here we looked at the case where a is one of the numbers from 1 up to p minus 1. If we now look at the case where a is an integer, an a not 0, uh, and p if p doesn't divide a, then we can simply take our integer a and put our mod p glasses on and read this modulo p and call this a bar. And now a bar is an integer in zp, uh, well zp star in fact, or zp. And by what we did above, a to the p minus 1 is congruent to a bar to the p minus 1, and we saw that was 1 modulo p. So that's a little proof of Fermat's little theorem that follows very nicely from the Lagrange's theorem. So, um, as an example, we can evaluate 2 to the 10502 modulo 13. So I begin by just writing down from Fermat's little theorem, 7 to the 12 has to be 1 mod 13. And then I just do a little division here, and I get this number is 12 times um, 875. So I'm dividing this number by this 12 plus a remainder of 2. And that means 7 to this power is 7 to this, which is 7 to this power, but 7 to the 12 is 1, so this comes out to just give you 1, and all you get left is 7 squared, which is 49, and 49 is 10 modulo 13. Now, as a corollary to Fermat's little theorem, we can just multiply both sides of Fermat's little theorem by a, and then if a is if a is 0, then, or if a is divisible by p, well, we just get 0 if congruent to 0. In other, but if, if otherwise, then multiplying by a gives me a to the p is congruent to a mod p. Now I'm going to introduce here Euler's totient function. As we've looked at what happens in the case of um, u sub p, i.e. z sub p star, we now want to look more generally at u sub n, the group of units modulo n. And we're going to let phi of n, this is a Greek letter phi, p-h-i, 
This is called Euler's Phi or Euler's Totient Function. Turns up in a lot of places in mathematics, not just in number theory, but also in combinatorics and elsewhere. So phi of n uh, denotes the number of elements in u sub n. That is, phi of n is the number of positive integers less than and relatively prime to a positive integer n. So phi of 12, for example, is 4 because the numbers that are relatively prime to 12 are 1, 5, 7, and 11. There's four of those, so we put that equal to 4. Phi of 1 is 0. We're going to learn more about phi later, and in fact we'll derive a very nice formula for phi of n. But for the time being, I just want to um, connect this back with um, with um, what we did with um, Fermat's theorem. So Euler's theorem is a generalization of Fermat's theorem. So Fermat's theorem said a to the p minus 1 is 1 mod p if p is prime. Euler found the correct generalization of this, which was very clever. And it says if you've got two numbers a and n are relatively prime, so n is your modulus, then a to the phi of n is congruent to 1 mod n. Notice that in the case of where n is a prime, then phi of a prime, 5p, is p minus 1. So this just collapses back to, uh, to Fermat's little theorem. Now again, the proof of this is fairly easy, now that we've got Lagrange's theorem. So if a is uh, in u sub n, and a has order t, then we know that t has to be a factor of 5n because the order of the element must divide the order of the group. So that says 5n is some multiple of t, k times t for some integer k. And a to the phi of n then is just e to the t k, which is e to the t all to the k. And a to the t is 1 because a had order t. And it falls out so nicely. Nice example of where the abstract algebra, the group theory, can be used to prove the number theoretic, re theoretic result really quickly. So if a is any integer relatively prime to n, so this worked for a in un, and now I want to show it's true for any integer. Well, you take any integer relatively prime to n, you read it modulo n, that will give you an element a bar that's in u sub n. And if I raise a to the phi of n is congruent to a, um, well, a bar phi of n, and a bar now is in u sub n, so this is 1 by what we did above. So as I mentioned, observe that if p is prime, then 5p is p minus 1. So Euler's theorem is simply a generalization of Fermat's theorem. And as a little example, you might like to have a go at calculating this. 5, 12 is 4. So we know that 5 to the 4th is 1. And so we're going to take this, divide it by 4, and get the remainder, and do it similar in similar fashion to the example I did above. And I'll leave you to calculate that result. And that's the end of the chapter on congruences. We're going to move on and study in some depth the structure of this UM and Z sub M um, groups in the next section.